Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous session we stopped you know looking at decrement factor which is the outside surface you know inside surface delta t t i max minus t i min by outside surface delta t t o max minus t o min which is you know a number between 0 and 1. Then you know what our Indian codes national building code talks about it is about thermal damping it has delta t o which is the outside air temperature range it is not surface temperature it is outside temperature amplitude versus the inside temperature air temperature drive valve temperature amplitude. So, we said if the ambient temperature you know diurnal variation is delta t is 20 degrees versus indoor is 10 degrees then you will get a thermal damping of about 50 percentage. National building code tells you how much is a minimum required thermal damping for you know places where the diurnal variation is quite high then you will need more thermal damping whereas places where you have less diurnal variation like humid areas coastal areas where the amplitude of variation diurnal cycle variation is about say 6 to 7 degrees or some cases lesser than that where you will need you mean know, you may not need much of thermal damping they may not be of use to you. To continue with some examples thermal damping and the time lag also varies with respect to orientation of the particular room or the space say for example for a north versus east versus south exposed wall surfaces the time lag and decrement factor in this case time lag remained the same but there can be differences also the decrement factor considerably varies because it is a surface temperature value so the ambient outside surface all air temperature can go peak at a particular time cycle and it may vary little bit between one side to the other orientation one orientation to the other orientation it strongly depends on the fenestration area and the compactness of the space thermal damping especially if you look at what you know our national code talks about I have drawn a line here because for this particular climate it is a hard and dry climate which we did the assessment the minimum required thermal damping was 60 percentage it said minimum your envelope should give 60 percent thermal damping below which it says it is not compliant to the national building code. So, most of the materials that we tested this is a concrete wall 150 mm brick wall aerated concrete you have a insulated wall outside versus inside insulation you have a cavity wall system you have a solid block cement block system most of them had thermal damping which is above the prescribed limit. But please make a note of one thing it is very you know critically or strongly dependent upon the fenestration area. So, you take a room you know a 10 foot by 10 foot or 12 foot by 12 foot room which has a very large window surface which is open then the damping is going to be really low naturally you know the convective mechanism sets in and the indoor is more closely connected or closely corresponds with the ambient temperature cycle. So, in that sense it depends on the fenestration area number of surfaces exposed and the overall compactness of the space if the space is more compactly designed three sides is you know three sides are enclosed just one side is exposed or partly exposed which is also shaded a small window imagine the case of how traditional buildings were built in hard dry climates or even colder climates we looked at some examples connecting those examples if you look at these things are compact with very low fenestration area they used to have high thermal damping that is the indoor cycle of variation was much lesser compared to the compared to the ambient diurnal cycle. So, you know it depends on the material it depends on where you put your insulation and whether you have insulation or not thermal damping considerably varies apart from this it varies from month to month day to day because you know precisely day to day that is what we have shown in these box and whisker plots the mean value lies somewhere around 85 in this case 80 it goes as high as 88 then it drops down but there is also a considerable variation across you know it ranges somewhere from 68 to 88 and all the way high to 90. So, 20 to 25 percent difference can be observed because you know it is a daily phenomena what is the delta t today may not be there tomorrow and the wall has to respond to it or the space rather has to respond to it. So, thermal damping 
though national building code draws a line at 60 for this particular climate zone it doesn't mean it is going to remain as single number all through you may, you may have to take a you know representative day and then calculate this thermal damping as a number if it is above 60 which means it is compliant before getting into the next thing another important factor that we have to understand here thermal damping requirements whether all the climates require thermal damping as i said when the diurnal temperature variations are much lower you may not need thermal damping at all or another tricky case is the case of composite climate where for the extreme dry spells of summer where you have you know more or less it is mimicking the hard dry climate diurnal variations are much high solar radiation is also high in that case you will require thermal damping again during extreme winters you will require thermal damping but there are other two spells where you have the monsoon season which is really sultry the diurnal variations are not that that high as summers and winters you will need more breezy or less damped surfaces as well as the you know moderate season where you may not need the thermal damping effects in the building so you know the design has to take into account these factors another term which is commonly in use is a diurnal heat capacity or the dhc it is also an indicator of capacitive insulation i am not getting into the formulas because you know during this course i don't want to put too many equations or numbers here to develop a fundamental understanding it is a function of building materials density specific heat conductivity and thickness if you have to calculate the diurnal heat capacity of a particular built form or a space you have to calculate it by taking a sigma or summing up the dhc values of each surface which is exposed to the interior air it is like a representative of how thermal you know thermal, how much thermal mass is available for heat storage that is why we are taking you know each surface exposed to the interior surface interior air indoor air for heat gain and losses heat exchange to take place so in this there is a small equation which gives you the required heat capacity we have been talking about capacitive insulation so let us also try to understand how much we will require for a particular location so you are building in a place say you are building your house in delhi or you are building your house in a hard drive place like jaisalmer then how much amount of thermal capacity you have to build in into your envelope so what capacity should the wall contain there is a simple equation of course this is not you know physically validated for indian context it is developed in some other country but still it gives you a very good or fair indicator there are you know follow ups which are available improved versions for different climatic zones are also available but to give you a basic understanding of it this is q required that is a heat capacity required is a factor of the outside delta tto max that is you know outside temperature air temperature revolve temperature maximum minus temperature minimum this gives you the ambient delta t plus it also includes the absorptivity of the surface and the solar intensity that is the solar radiation here so what happens when the delta t is high you are in a hot dry climate in summer the delta t ambient delta t goes as high as 20 22 degrees so when this is high the heat capacity required is going to be high take a coastal region where the delta t is of the order of 6 to 8 degrees relatively the q is going to come down much considerably because this is a crucial factor 2.5 into delta t so this crucial factor determines how much increase or decrease is required in terms of your required heat capacity i have you know substituted this in the case of amdabad hard and dry climate as per our national building code we took one particular day where the ambient temperature delta t was found to be 13 degrees and the solar radiation i max was 925 watts per meter square we have taken a wall surface which is you know the absorption is 0.3 that is it is more or less a white painted glassy surface which is reflecting enough amount of solar it is only 30 percent absorptive in that case you get a q required that is solar you know sorry the heat capacity required is around 60 watt hour per meter square degree centigrade imagine solar radiation is going to go up again it will you know have some implication on the required heat capacity this will go up as the solar radiation intensity goes up what if the wall gets more absorptive instead of a white painted surface which is 30 percent reflective that is 0.3 absorption coefficient instead of this i am substituting say a black painted surface a matte black surface which is 0.85 or 0.9 absorption then as a consequence the q required is going to go up say a dark surface versus a light surface 
a dark surface will require more thermal capacity whereas a light surface this will come down as the diurnal difference delta t increases this will go up and as the solar intensity intensity of solar radiation increases the required heat capacity will go up as i said this is not a precisely validated equation for indian context but it gives us a fair idea about where thermal capacity or the heat capacity comes to use and to what proportion we need or we do not need in specific seasons and locations. The next factor which national building code talks about is a thermal time constant TDC. Simple terms it is sigma q that is a heat gain the total by the thermal transmittance u value. To get it more in detail this is the surface coefficient which we looked at in the last class sigma. So, as many layers are there for a single homogeneous layer it is just one, but as many layers this will be calculated and then totaled out where you have other things like thickness. So, it is a factor of thickness, it is a factor of conductivity effectively this gives you the thermal conductance value, resistance value. So, then you also have the density as well as specific heat into pitch in the picture. So, as the density and specific heat increases your thermal time constant value is going to go up. As the thickness of the wall increases thermal time constant is going to go up. As the conductivity of the wall increases, thermal time constant is going to get down further. Take a case of two, you know, take two examples. This is the same wall, it is the same wall system, thickness is same 150 mm, 150 mm. I am going to introduce a very thin, you know, slender insulation system here. It is just a 12 mm, a thin insulation sheet. If I am, you know, introducing this on the outside surface versus the inside surface the u value or the thermal transmittance will remain the same. It is coming close to 2.5 or 2.6 watts per meter square Kelvin. So, this is a resistive or conductive heat flow which is accounted in the u value. So, you may not know the difference between an outside insulation versus the inside insulation. Whereas, where will you find the difference? You will find the difference in terms of thermal time constant. If it is put in the outside surface, you get a thermal time, time constant of 18.4, whereas if you put it inside you get a thermal time constant of 12.5. 16, I have put in bracket because 16 is what national building code recommends for this location. There is a considerable variation depending on where you put your insulation. It has an impact on heat gain and losses where you may not be able to understand it if you look at the U value. This is where I said there are technical data sheets available, but if we do not have a fundamental understanding of which number to choose, look at and what to choose we will not be ending up with the right product most of the time. So, apart from u value, we also have to keep in tap, keep a tag of the thermal time constant which is a crucial indicator of the heat transfer between outside to inside. The next indicator is thermal performance index. This equation thermal performance index gives you T in peak that is inside peak surface temperature. So, if this is a wall surface, the peak surface temperature say it may go to 35 degrees minus 30, I will explain what 30 and this 8 means, minus 30 by 8 into 100. This 30 comes from a series of calculation, it goes all the way to the next index that is a building index. It also accounts for the maximum heat gain and it is done for a specific you know wall system say a brick wall and a standard compliant wall system and a room space along with a given amount of fenestration area, then they found 30 degree as a comfort temperature in that range that is a maximum allowable temperature 30 degrees and 8 because they found that when the wall surface temperature rises above 8 degrees, say it can go up to 38 degrees, then it will not be causing you discomfort. So, 38 minus 30 this gives us 8 as a number. So, this particular thing again expressed in percentage. Now, Getting little back you know to one of the previous modules where we talked about thermal comfort, we talked about radiant asymmetry, we talked about what is a horizontal radiant asymmetry permitted that is what is a cold wall versus a hot wall. There also the IS code that is a recent ISO codes, international codes as well as ASHRAE, they specify what is the allowable increase in the surface temperature of wall compared to the air temperature. Say air temperature is at 25 degrees up to what extent the surface temperature of the wall can go so that the maximum beyond which you will start feeling the radiant discomfort. So, this exactly was being talked about in our national code. This was developed somewhere in the 70s and 80s where you know they have estimated that up to 38 degrees this component of radiant discomfort will not be much impactful 
beyond which say when the wall temperature touches 39, 30, you know 40 degrees, then this is going to cause more problems. Based on this, there is a limit which is set, they have basically classified the wall system into good, fair, poor, very poor and extremely poor. If the thermal performance rating is less than or equal to 75 in this particular context, you require 36 degrees peak surface temperature or lesser. The peak heat gain will be 34 and half you know watts per meter square. This is you know termed as class A building or a good performing system. This primarily now you will understand since we are talking about the peak inside surface temperature, we are you know actually talking about a particular wall system. Now you know to brush up little bit more, we talked about element level property, we talked about component level property and we also talked about assembly level property. Here this thermal performance index more closely talks about the whole wall system or the assembly level property. When the wall is in place, it is plastered, it is painted, it is put in place, it is not a static indicator, it is a dynamic indicator. The peak surface temperature is obtained as a part of different sets of phenomena. Finally, the result is T surface inside peak. So, you substitute this. If you are able to get less than 75, it means your peak heat gain will not go above 34.5 d you know watts per meter square then your wall system the total assembly is deemed to be performing good on the other hand if the tpa is greater than 225 which means the inside surface temperature goes above 48 degrees that means if you touch the wall surface if you measure the surface temperature inside it is going to go as high as 48 or above which is really not comfortable as a consequence, you have a very high heat gain, more than 103.5 watts per meter square heat gain will be there, which is extremely poor. Imagine a thin metal sheet, what will be the inside peak surface temperature? It may go as high as 50, 52 degrees, outside of course will be much higher, gets heated up, then it is extremely a poor thermal classification. So, this is developed. Apart from this, there are correct, you know, correction factors. I am not presenting all the tables. I will recommend you to read SP41, that is Handbook of Functional Efficiency in Buildings, special, you know, publication 41 of National Building Code, where they have also cited a set of correction factors, where you can substitute this and find out location specific. See, if your climate zone is different or if your wall surface absorptivity is different, then there is a correction factor which is given substituting that you will get the actual thermal performance index. What I you know what you need to understand here thermal performance index in this case essentially takes conductive capacitive as well as resistive insulation reflective insulation in picture. Since they have given correction factors for absorptivity it takes the reflective component also they have taken inside peak surface temperature which is a factor of your conductive heat flow as well as it gives you the capacity storage and emitting capacity of the wall. So, effectively this gives you a comprehensive idea about the whole wall assembly. Some examples, most of the materials were fair performing material, you can take a brick wall, you can take an aerated concrete wall, you can take a cement block wall, some insulated wall system, most of them are lying somewhere between the band of a fair performing or class B material. Further you insulate it or improve upon it, you may be able to get a class A or good performing material. This is for a naturally ventilated building. In case of air conditioned building, you have another version of TPI, thermal performance index. Instead of this peak surface temperature and this temperature numbers here, you get the peak heat gain that is Q and the maximum allowable heat gain. So, which I am not presenting here, but there is an alternate version for air conditioned building, where again you have a classification between good and poor. It also varies from orientation to orientation. This we tested for three different orientation, the same wall performed differently in three different orientations. To sum up, this is what National Building Code gives you. It gives you standards for exposed wall as well as roof for different climatic conditions. Say, let us take exposed wall first. If it is a hot dry or hot humid climate, then you have a maximum U value of 2.56. So, your wall or a system that you choose should have a U value less than 2.56. Now, this is not the end of the story. The next thing is the TPA, thermal performance index, maximum of 125. If you recollect it, 125 here means 
above in this range. So, it, they say that at least the wall should be a fairly performing wall. So, 125 gives you a cutoff that is where they have given here TPI maximum of 125, it should not exceed it. Then T this is the thermal time constant, they have given as 16, this is minimum. So, thermal time constant should be higher than this. Here you also get where to put your insulation and how to place your system, shaded wall versus unshaded wall, orientation, everything affects both TPI as well as thermal time constant. Then they also give you another class for damping, where we saw minimum of 60 percentage, this is where they give for harder regions, they say at least you need 60 percent thermal damping. Apart from this, if it is a warm humid zone or a moderate zone, there is, there is a relaxation in U value, you can go as high as 2.9, you can also have higher TPA value, thermal performance index can be 175, thermal time constant is retained, it is 16 and thermal damping is retained to 60, which actually varies from day to day as I said. Next is a building index, building index is cumulates the heat gain from various surfaces, fenestrations, wall, roof put together, they calculate what is overall watts per meter square that is a heat gain through the overall building system into a particular space. So, there is a range which is given building index from 0 to 50, you can expect an ambient you know indoor air temperature of around 32 degrees or lesser deemed to be comfortable, 51 to 100 you can expect 32 to 36 degrees slightly warm condition, if it goes above 100 you can have a very high indoor air temperature which is perceived to be hot. They have also worked out some examples, take a multi story construction you take you know a top floor unshaded glass area 15 percent of the floor area that is you know floor area to fenestration that ratio of you know fenestration to floor area ratio is 15 percent it is north orientation the building index is 85 this is slightly warm condition but then getting here with the south orientation and the glass area shaded you can bring it down to 73 which is again slightly warm further the same as 5 that is 15 percent shaded window south facing, but it is on the ground floor. Now, the roof is not exposed, then your building index drastically drops down from 85 we have come all the way to 56, where it is comfortable and slightly warm. Based on this what inference we draw, we have a building index and we tentatively know as a designer, this space is going to be partly comfortable and slightly warm. Then we can try adjusting the orientations we can try adjusting the shading systems, we can try and enhance the shading system provided or we can try insulating the roof system. If we are not able to you know get to the lower floors naturally you know you have a top floor, you can try insulating it minimize the heat gain. So, that you can bring the building index value down and improve the comfort indoor. To get a quick recap of the indices that we looked at and what they actually mean, first we looked at U value, what I have here? is the material property, the impact on design and zoning and the impact of solar exposure. What I am trying to present here, whether these indices take into account these three things or not and to what extent. Say for example, a value like simple value like thermal transmittance or U value, it only takes into consideration the material property, it takes the density of the material, it takes the thickness of the material and the surface property, it takes into account only the material property it does not really give importance or there is no weightage for which orientation where you put your material, what is your window area, what is your wall area, these things are not accounted, this is a basic material property. Similarly, thermal time constant is a material property, apart from just the conductivity, it also includes the density as well as the thermal capacity of the material, specific heat capacity is also included, but still this is also only the material property, two things are there. Next, when you talk about thermal damping, it has importance for material property, but it also gives importance for design zoning. So, moment you change the design compactness, your zoning is different, thermal damping is going to vary. It also gives weightage for solar exposure that is orientation of the particular space, one side versus two side oriented or a north versus south oriented space will have an impact on thermal damping. The next important thing, thermal performance index, it gives you know weightage to the solar exposure that is the orientation to which the particular wall is facing and whether it is shaded or not, because if the solar temperature or the outside surface is getting higher, the inside surface temperature is going to go high. Because of this, 
thermal performance index might considerably vary. The next weightage is given to material property followed by design and zoning. Building index again gives more importance to the design and zoning, how do you reshape or reconfigure your building mass, then it gives weightage to solar exposure and at last to the material property. So, you know to get a consolidated idea, we might need u value which is critically essential, but we also need two or three other numbers minimum to take a proper decision on which material to choose and actually how to design our building by itself. Let us you know take a peek at what other countries are doing before getting into this slide. We talked about thermal capacity, use of thermal mass, we have been traditionally doing, but most of the existing practices we do not look at thermal capacity as a crucial indicator. But recently you know few years back Australia introduced a you know new substitute or you know an annex for u value, they have a stringent u value requirement for their buildings, they introduce the new factor that is thermal mass enhanced u value. So, for example, if you have a thin wall system, your wall system for example, has a gypsum board versus a thin gypsum board and a thermal insulation backing plus a inside finish. So, overall wall thickness probably would be say 60 or 75 mm wall. These are two thin sheets, if you look at the u value probably you will get around say 0 0.6 or 0 0.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. So, this will be wall system 1. The next wall system for example, you have a sheet, this is outside facing for example, then you have the insulation, then you have a inside block work or say brick wall, any any you know masonry construction or concrete anything, if you have a wall system. Here you may have the overall you know thickness might be say 200 mm, your u value could go up to say for example, 2 watts per meter square Kelvin or say let us say 1.5 watts per meter square Kelvin. As per the regular code, if they say minimum required u value is say 0 0.8, the required value is 0 0.8. For example, assume this wall system is meeting the code, whereas this wall system is not meeting the code. As per the new enhancement which they have introduced, they found that though this wall system does not have the resistive insulative property, this has a crucial factor of capacitive insulation. So, once you have capacitive insulation, this is storing heat, it is re-releasing heat, it can be inside, it can be outside, it varies considerably of course, you are you know thermal time constant or damping values will considerably vary, but apart from that this has capacitive insulation. So, to give this allowance, uh, for using capacitive material like you know dense concrete blocks or a concrete masonry wall system itself. The code says mass enhanced u value, if you have thermal mass they give you relaxation in terms of u value. Of course, you cannot go as high as you know 3, 3.5, but still you have a consideration for introducing thermal mass into the wall system. Similarly, there are other countries like Brazil which also have a relaxation in u values if you are using a thermal mass material. Let us take a peek at what Singapore does, why closely because it is a tropical country, more so they have been rigorously working on the thermal codes and building performance standard, they have been revising it quite you know consistently. They talk about a number called RETV that is effective thermal transfer value, earlier it was OTTV overall thermal transfer value. First cut they say that if the building window wall ratio that is the size of windows are less than 30 percent and the shading coefficient, we will talk about shading coefficient you know little later in the next session less than 0 0.7, then you have satisfied the codal requirement, but in case if it is more, then they give a empirical formula which essentially contains u value of the wall, the window wall ratio, u value of fenestration, then certain correction factors to be included, overall you will get the net heat gain through the building envelope watts per meter square. Now, the current code is around 22 watts per meter square is permitted. So, you can have a larger window, they do not you know you know say that you have to have smaller window, but if you have to meet the code, your 
overall heat gain should not exceed 22 watts per meter square. You know now you know think back with our building index example, what did our code say? It says that building index between 0 to 50 watts per meter square is deemed to be comfortable. Similarly, in terms of the other factors like thermal performance index, when they say 125 is allowable, they also said the peak heat gain will be 32 to 40. You know in this slide, when you know when you have a TPI of less than or equal to 75, peak heat gain is 34.5 watts per meter square, which is a good quality construction. So, you know our standard also says critical, you know it gives critical weightage for the maximum heat gain and allowable heat transfer through the particular system. So, we essentially looked at three different levels, element level, component level and assembly level. We you know primarily looked at what our national building code says apart from just one or two examples abroad. As I said there are two other important things that is a moisture transmission through building envelope or the enclosure and the air tightness of the building enclosure. As a part of this module we are not looking at it, but essentially they play an important role or a significant role in the overall performance or thermal performance of the building enclosure. Thank you.